Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, San Francisco's premier author interview program. And today we have with us a man who's won two Pulitzer Prizes, one for a book called Founding Brothers and another for a book called American Sphinx. His name is Joseph Ellis, and he's here today to talk about a book called His Excellency George Washington, which has now been put out in paperback by Vintage Books. Welcome aboard. Hey, good to be here. Thanks for coming along. You know, uh, the Washington Post, in uh, reviewing your book, uh, said in, in part, Ellis's aim is to get beyond the monument into the man. And he does so in a convincing, plausible way. And I think what makes it plausible is uh, you're helping us to meet a new and different George Washington, one that, you know, is nowhere near the monument. For, for example, you, you point out that as early as uh, 1765, George Washington was in a kind of personal rebellion against the British Empire. Tell us about that. Mm. <laughs> Well, you're right about the fact that I'm searching for the man beneath the monument and that uh, if you go to the Washington Monument, there are no words there other than the graffiti. The graffiti, yeah. Yeah. Um, And that I'm trying to recover the young Washington as much as the older Washington. Most of the images we have in our minds of Washington are from the Gilbert Stewart portraits of the later 1790s. Mm Mm-hmm. As a young man, <clears throat> Washington was sort of like John Wayne circa 1939 and stagecoach. Um, he's really quite a, quite a hunk. Um, you know, he's six, three and a half, about a head taller than anybody else. <clears throat> but you're also right that he develops a hostility to British authority based on a couple of things that are unusual and singular, not just what everybody else thought. Part of it is he had applied for a commission in the British Army, and they'd rejected him. Oh, that's right, yeah. And instead of thinking of that as a kind of honest and and justifiable decision, he thought it was a stupid mistake. (laughs) Uh, He thought he was really deserving, and that he was better than they were. Um, And he had this this, uh, merchant in England, Carey is his name, who owned this company in was his consignment uh, representative. He would take Washington's tobacco and sell it and then give Washington goods and services in return. And Washington always thought he was being cheated. The face of the British Empire for Washington wasn't Parliament and the king so much as it was uh, this trade relationship that seemed to him to be uh, rigged for him to lose. He's like one of the early, you know, later populists who always thinks that the, you know, that he's being manipulated mm-hmm. and he mm-hmm. hates that so he begins to declare his own personal independence of the british empire in part because he really feels that the british uh, imperial economic system doesn't allow him uh, to make a living and is driving him into debt and, and that is. was a, that was a very uh, deep seated uh, kind of rebellion it's something that was with him i think all his life yeah. uh, he's really an anglophobe he really thinks that the british um have a superior attitude and presume that they can impose these kind of systems on the Americans. Um, he he also has this strong sense that they're taking land away from him that he owns in the West. He owns about 50,000 acres west of the Alleghenies, and they close that off with the proclamation of 1763 and say that nobody can own land out there, and that's simply taking it away from him outright. He feels that's wrong, and and that's the the other variable here is as he you can see him beginning to become a person committed to American independence and also committed to the country's growth westward. Yes, uh, rather than the future uh, of America was not across the Atlantic. The future of America was to the west in those forests that he had explored and surveyed as a young man. That even when he was president, he said the ambassadors from England and France are less important than the Indian ambassadors that come to see us here in, in Philadelphia. Um, so he really does think the future of America for the next century is going to be the consolidation of the continent. And he's right about that. Well, he really proves the Brits wrong when uh, they they wouldn't make him a general or, or an officer. Mm. I mean, when his fellow Americans make him the commander of the Continental Army. And in reading your book, I, I come up with the question, why did we do that? 
He was not, <laughs> you're right, by any standard, a military genius. He lost more battles than he won. Indeed, he lost more battles than any victorious general in modern history. And yet, his his peers, if you will, uh, fellow revolutionaries, perhaps said, this is the guy. Why did they do that? Well, Adam said it was because he was the tallest man in the room. <laughs> and that, uh, you know, at six, three and a half, he was... That's had, like the choice for sheriff. That's <laughs> right. It's like, and he, he was the only one wearing a, a military uniform. <laughs> so he was almost auditioning for the role. And, um, and uh, though he... He claimed to be very, very apprehensive about this and that uh, he he was reluctant to take the position. Um, but uh, I think that, um, you know, we need to talk more about that. Yeah. Not only was he a reluctant general, he also was a general who could not fight the way he wanted to fight. We're going to get into strategy and stuff when we come back. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at JimFosterCoc and email JimFosterCoc at gmail.com. This is Conversations on the Coast. The book today is His Excellency George Washington, the author, the Pulitzer Prize winning author Joseph J. Ellis, and uh, as we uh, went to the break, we were we were talking about strategy. Now, the Christian Science Monitor said about your book. I want to get this in before we get the strategy. Absolutely fascinating. Underscores how extraordinary Washington's accomplishments really were. And if you've got to, you know, do your main thing against the grain of what you believe in, I think that gets extraordinary if you accomplish anything. In Washington's case, as I understand it, what he would like to do as a general, as a fighter, as a leader, is attack, 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 and also do the biggest battles possible. Right. He and, has a, a, a sort of an honor-driven definition of war, meaning if the— if the enemy, in this case William Howe, presents himself on the field, you are honor bound to respond and to engage him. Um, and not to do so is to be guilty of some violation of an aristocratic code of honor. And the problem is that the Continental Army is no match for the for the uh, British Army. The British Army average length of service is seven years, and the Continental Army is six months. Uh, <laughs> they have uniforms, and we don't. We don't have uniforms. We don't have ammunition enough. We half of the troops have smallpox, and Washington's attempt to defend New York City was a kind of stupid idea. There's no way that he could win that. Twelve thousand troops against thirty-two thousand British. It was a disaster. He had to flee across New Jersey down to Pennsylvania. That's where Tom Paine, the first embedded journalist, says uh, <laughs> these are the times that try men's, men's souls. souls. Yes, There's yes. a woman that's uh, present in New York who's, uh, uh, who Hal wants to have an affair with. And uh, the reason Hal doesn't pursue Washington, and if he had pursued him, the war would have been over. They would have caught Washington and hung him, and we wouldn't know about him. <laughs> uh, and Mrs. Loring... Um, was what really saved us. And I think she gave her all during that winter and that we should probably put a monument up to this woman uh, because without her, we might very well have not won the American Revolution. Obviously a true patriot who deserves a statue in a a, a cocktail (laughs) lounge or someplace like that, I I, I think. So at any rate... uh, he is counseled not to go after the big battle. He is counseled uh, to go on and, and and fight what's called the Fabian strategy. Fabian strategy is named after the Roman general Lucius Quintatus Fabian, who in the Carthaginian War adopted the strategy of refusing to engage unless you have a vastly superior force. It's a kind of quasi guerrilla strategy. Washington came to it, as you suggested, uh, unnaturally. He didn't like this. It went against the grain of his own instincts. But eventually, by Valley Forge, I think, in 1777, 78, he came to understand something really important that a lot of other generals and great generals never understood. Namely, he didn't have to win the war. Yeah. The British had to win the war. Uh, he was leading, if you will, an insurgency. 
And even though the British were the major military power in the world and never been defeated, that if they couldn't find a strategic center to the rebellion, eventually they just give up. And that's what happened. And in that sense, the British position in, in the American Revolution is somewhat similar to our position in Iraq now. Isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, we're, they're here, but no, they're there. They're over here. And you can you can defeat them and you can wipe them out, but then you move away and then they come back they again. They come back again. And, yeah. uh, and so controlling the countryside was really an important thing. One of the reasons that the, the American Continental Army is positioned from like the hills of western Connecticut down into New Jersey in this arc is that that's the center of the population. And so by positioning the army there, he's, con- he's controlling that part of the population so that they uh, they can't go Tory. And one of the things we don't fully appreciate is the degree to which American public opinion was really divided on this war. And um, when Washington looked at the roles of the British Army at the end of the war, he said there were more Americans in the British Army than there were British. Uh, it's an interesting fact that doesn't fit patriotic mythology. Yeah, and one of the uh, one of the big figures uh, on trading, uh, being a traitor to the other side, that you bring out here is Benedict Arnold. Yeah, who was actually you know leading uh, British forces against Americans. Benedict Arnold was Washington's number one combat officer. He had in, in battles in Canada and in Saratoga displayed incredible courage. So when when you lost Arnold, it was really it was a sign that something was wrong. And the truth of the matter is the Continental Army was not being paid. Arnold was not being promoted at the rate that he thought he should be. He also fell in love with this woman who was a a loyalist. Mm -hmm. Um, But when Arnold went over, it was a really severe blow to the psyche of Washington and to most of the other officers because they thought he was the top of the top. Uh, Somehow, you know, we we win this war. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which, even after reading your book rather closely, I I, I, I think uh, I'm still amazed that we that we did. And and poor Washington, exhausted from eight long years of commanding the army and winning the war, he retires, but not for long, as we shall see when we return. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at JimFosterCoc and email JimFosterCoc at gmail.com. This is Jim Foster. This is Conversations on the Coast. His Excellency George Washington is the book. Joseph J. Ellis is the guest. And uh, the New York Times said, absorbing an intensive portrait eloquently conveys the magnitude of Washington's accomplishments. And I would think that, uh, you know, winning that that war against the crazy odds is magnitude enough. But uh, And it was. I mean, we got to recover that. This is the, you know, 13 separate colonies coming together to defeat the major military and naval power in the world. Washington himself, after the war was over, said, if anybody really tried to tell the story of how we won... He would be accused of writing fiction. Fiction, yes. Um, yes. Because no one would believe that we could have baffled, to the word he used, the British forces for seven and a half years. And, and, and at that point, he makes what you call a what kind of exit? The greatest exit in American history. Uh, he comes down to Annapolis to surrender his sword, to become the American Cincinnatus, that is, turning his sword into plowshares. Plow shares. And um, think about it. Uh, Julius Caesar didn't do this. Oliver Cromwell didn't do this. Napoleon didn't do this. Stalin didn't do this. Mao didn't do this. Castro didn't do this. So that he's one of the... MacArthur fig- did... Oh, never mind. <laughs> well, he never got a chance, I guess. Um, <laughs> Truman, never mind. Uh, another another but, day. Uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's in some sense his signature moment. And they, they have a big ball, uh, a dance at Annapolis, and he dances every dance. And the witness says the ladies were lined up in rows, quote, to get a touch of him. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And then the doors open. It's like a scene out of a John Ford movie. The horses are waiting at the door, and he's gone, you know? And that's why I think it's the greatest exit in American history. Riding into the star-filled night. Going back to Mount Vernon. <sighs> to the fig trees. To the fig trees, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> He's not allowed to stay there. No, he's not. Because something comes up called the uh, Constitutional Convention. 
and and this is a this is a time when uh, civilian George Washington would really like not to serve anymore. He says, "I've done my duty. I've taken the ship into port. I don't want to take it out again." Um, uh, he doesn't think the time is ripe for a new constitution. He thinks there ought to be one. He wants the federal government to be given a c- considerably increased powers. He's a federalist in that regard. But well, re- and, the, and the whole picture that you that that, that you give us of of uh, the post war times mm. is a, a a period of of confusion. Yeah, and you know what do we do next? Right. So that the that that convention absolutely had to be called. Well, uh, it to, did. To, to, to form the government and, and, and also to answer questions. Well, you know, if you think about Iraq now, there's three, three segments of Iraq, the, the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shia. In the United States, there were equivalent three sections with very different identities, the New England, the Middle, and the South. And the thing that would have probably happened if they hadn't called the convention was that we become like Europe, a Europeanized America, Scandinavia, New England. Western Europe, the middle colonies, Mediterranean, the south. That's what would have happened. And there, the term American was a term of, uh, well, it was, it, was, it was a negative term. Right, right. It was a negative term. It was like these bumbling, you know, uh, sort of barbarian Americans. And it's the only thing that they can agree on is that Washington represents what they believe in. And and that's that phrase, you know, first in the hearts of Americans. Washington is the guy that that congeals, allows the forces of a national American existence to congeal around him. Yeah, it's as though everybody can 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 fight and and battle and argue. But somehow he's there. Right. And and he's the he's the symbol of strength and power. And stability, and he is. I mean, in Iraq, there's nobody like Washington because they didn't win their own revolution. They didn't produce a leadership, uh, and Washington becomes the singular figure, the one indispensable man. And at the end of that constitutional convention, guess what? They <laughs> draft him as the first president of the United States, and th- this guy likes to travel in style. Okay, mm. he's he's traveling from Mount Vernon to New York. Okay, for the first inauguration. And uh, it became one long coronation ceremony, you write. It began with crowds of more than 10,000 celebrants cheering from amidst cannon salutes and poetic tributes at Baltimore and Wilmington. Outside Philadelphia, he was obliged to mount a white horse so that the 20,000 spectators could see him as he crossed the Schuylkill. The Schuylkill. 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 They threw rose petals in front of him, too. Charles Wilson Peel had designed an arch of triumph over the bridge, and his daughter Angelica lowered a laurel crown upon Washington's head as he passed under the arch. Hail Caesar, I would say at that point. Don't He's you? the closest thing to a king we've ever had. Yeah. He is. Yeah. And we could trust him with kingly power because he had demonstrated that he could walk away from power. Um, but... The monarchical fears are very virulent then, and when Washington would ride around with his leopard skin uh, saddle uh, cover and stuff, uh, people said, "There's an you know this dangerous." But the only thing that could save us is Washington, and he he did. Our time talking about His Excellency George Washington by Joseph J. Ellis is up. Unfortunately, the book is yours. Go buy it. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at JimFosterCoc and email JimFosterCoc at gmail.com.